Central Baptist Church through the way of internet. Appreciate Shane's hard, hard work to get all the equipment ready and working at the center and now back here at the office. And we're grateful to him for doing that and for Crystal helping him. And we uh, appreciate it so much. And we're, we love you. It was so good to see you this morning. I apologize that I was so weak and uh, could not deliver well, but we'll try to do a little bit better tonight by the grace of God. And I uh, appreciate Robert. I know he misses being with us, but since he's uh, been exposed to this virus, he's quarantined himself away to protect you. And we appreciate that. And maybe we can get some tests for him and clear him to be back with us. Well, we are going to preach tonight on the promise of God, a promise of God never to leave you nor forsake you. Your, take your Bibles. We're looking at Hebrews 13, 5, where he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm asking you tonight, what's the greatest Bible evidence that we have to assure us this is true, to base this statement on us? What did Jesus do not only to say it, but to prove that he meant it with all of his heart and with all of his life? I want to use tonight as proof that he loves you beyond your comprehension. He loves you and he's promised himself who cannot lie eternally to love you, never leave you, and never forsake you. That or to bless your soul with spiritual ramifications from here and beyond. Oh, the great God, I can never find the words to adequately praise him as he deserves. But don't blame me for enjoying trying to. So tonight, as evidence that he of his promise never to leave us nor forsake us, I'm going to use the seven sayings of Christ from the cross. When Jesus was on the cross, he made seven glorious statements that within those statements, there was divine truths being revealed and promised. So let's begin tonight. The first statement of Jesus from the cross was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was praying for total forgiveness for those that beat him, tortured him, crucified him. So we see the first great truth of God here revealed in these seven statements begins with total forgiveness. Amazing grace. He began with total forgiveness. Jesus died on the cross, an unmerciful death. And uh, we see, but dying on the cross enabled him to pay our sin debt so we could be accepted and reconciled to the Father. For the wages of sin is death. I want you to look at the word forgive. It's the Greek word of phiamei. And it means to remove guilt, not just to forgive. He always goes beyond. And this word that he divinely used was to remove guilt. And that's much more than removing the feeling of guilt that bothers your conscience. He meant actually to remove the guilt of our commitment of sin, as though he sinned not us. He took his righteousness and replaced our guilt 
with his righteousness, our sin. And it was as though he, we sinned. We call it the doctrine of imputation, where he was made sin for us. Now, there's a great word that is a, it corresponds with forgive. And it's the word justified in the eyes of By faith, we're justified. A good way to remember what justified means is to break it down in, the, in these syllables. Just as if I never sinned. Justified. Just as if I never sinned. That's the kind of justification that Jesus purchased for us in his redemption on the cross. So the first thing that Jesus did was pray for our total forgiveness. Amazing grace. Then number two. Jesus talking to one of the thieves at his side. The thief had first gnashed on him with the other thief. But he saw something in Jesus that gave him faith to believe that Jesus who was who he said he was. That's what, remember me when you enter into thy kingdom. So he recognized Jesus as king and with kingdom and that was an expression of faith that jesus was who he said he was and he prayed to jesus remember me thou comest into thy kingdom and jesus said to him in his agony on the cross he forgot himself and looked to that dying hell-bound thief Old uh, Harold uh, Oliver B. He closed every broadcast. I heard him pray for many years. He said, Lord, as he closed this broadcast, snatch that sinner that's from the closest to hell, snatch him away and save him. And I think of that thief whenever I heard that. He snatched him right out of the gulping mouth of hell and uh, delivered him. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt, thou shalt be with me in paradise. So we see another great truth here. He said immediate paradise. Now after the resurrection, the paradise that was also called Abraham's bosom, which was the save for the place, save people went until Christ paid for sin on the cross. But then after the cross and the resurrection, Jesus delivered them that were held captive in that place of paradise or Abraham's bosom. Lost people went to the Hades side of torment, like the rich man in Luke uh, 16. But we find that Jesus delivered them and he took them immediately to heaven. And since then, every child of God dies goes immediately to heaven. So paradise, Abraham's bosom, was transferred to heaven. And now Christians who die are immediately with the Lord. And the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body to be present with the Lord. So Christian brothers and sisters, we, will, we die in Christ. We will immediately Praise God, be in the presence of the Lord. Then the third saying of the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now many people misunderstand this statement of Christ on the cross. And I think the scripture we began with, Hebrews 13, 5, helps us to understand it because he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Here Jesus was forsaken by his father. Why did the father forsake Jesus on the cross? You know why? God the father forsook Jesus on the cross so we would never be forsaken. So we would never... He took all the things that separated us from God and he took it away on the cross 
so that we could be reconciled with God and we could have the relationship in Christ with the Father and never be forsaken. Jesus took our place on the cross. He paid our sins, and we call that substitutionary atonement. So the Father saw that you were in Christ on the cross. He took your sins upon him, uh, Colossians 3. He nailed your certificate of sin debt on the cross of Calvary, display which was the sentence, the charge that you were guilty of sin worthy of eternity in hell. Jesus took that condemnation upon him on the cross. He wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities, chastisement of our peace upon him. By his stripes we heal. He God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Jesus took it all. And the Bible said when God sees the travail of his soul, he wouldn't be satisfied. So the Father saw you in Christ. Christ took you uh, in Christ. Uh, he took you into himself retroactively because he saw the end from the beginning. So he died for you. And in, in your heart, is the heart of Jesus. He loved you uh, before you ever were. That's amazing to me, but that's Godhood, and uh, it's beyond our understanding. Proverbs or Psalms 37, 5, I have been young and now old, and I have never seen the righteous forsaken. He was forsaken that we may never be forsaken. So Christ on the cross became our sin bearer in full. Isaiah 53, 6, God laid on him the iniquity of us all. The number five, or number four, excuse me. The fourth statement of Christ on the cross, Jesus looked down and he saw his mother Mary. And he said, woman, behold thy son. And he said to the disciple, which was John beside her, behold thy mother. How amazing it is to me that Jesus suffering crucifixion, he's dying of suffering crucifixion, the most excruciating, painful, cruel form of death ever devised by man. But still Jesus is thinking of others. And here it's his precious mother. And we see through this another great marvelous truth that Jesus will constantly care for you, no matter what. Nothing kept him from caring for his mother, and nothing will keep him from caring for you. Matter of fact, in his life and public ministry, he identified caring for you, his followers, as his mother. And that's a great testimony. But Mary is, was undoubtedly a widow here. And uh, she was cared for by her firstborn son, Jesus. Why did not Jesus appoint the other four half-brothers or blood brothers of, of the sons of Mary? It's because they were unbelievers. And that testified the fact that they, they weren't with her at the cross, but John was. And they had been summoned when Jesus was preaching in Nazareth. They tried to come up and get him to stop preaching. They were against him and so forth. So they were unbelievers till afterward. And then we know James got saved, Jude got saved, and we thank God for that. But before Jesus' death on the cross, none of his half-brothers or the sons of Mary, uh, there was four of them, none of them believed on Jesus by the record. So Jesus knew and who would care for her, and that would be John, the beloved. And so it testified he gave her the best care, a best care by saying uh, to take care of his mother. Jesus always cares for you, no matter what. He loves you unconditionally and forever by the grace of Almighty God. And he said, number five, a statement from the cross, I thirst. And this is another uh, mysterious uttering from the cross. Of course, we naturally think 
that he was dehydrated and thirsty from blood loss. But there's more to it than this. And if you'll study into theology, the, the theologians, there's theologians that connect the thirst with Jesus on the cross to his providing atonement. There's a possible connection here, and follow me through, with this representing full atonement, the thirst of Jesus on the cross. Now, the word atonement is three syllables, at one minute. And the mint of the Greek word there can readily be changed to with. You could say that atonement means at one with, referring to Christ. He made us one with him. He made us one reconciled to the Father. Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer in John 17. He prayed this before uh, the cross in 1721, not but long before he went up on the cross, he said, pray, Father, Lord, he said, Father, let them be one with him as the Father and Jesus are one. He prayed to the Father that we be one with him and the Father as Jesus was one with the Father. And Jesus, praise God, always gets his prayers answered. And I hope you're saying amen. So why did he say then, I thirst. In the garden, Jesus had prayed. Now, I, I'm going to show you a connection here that that uh, you don't that doesn't show up very easily. You have to look at it and look at it and look at it, and then you say, "There it is." All right, let's look at this. So Jesus prayed in the garden, "If it be Thy will, let this cup pass from me." Now, when did this cup, when did he drink this cup dry? I've always preached he did it in the garden. But hold on a minute. Let's see another option. Now, remember when they come to arrest Jesus with the soldiers and the temple soldiers and so forth and the traitor Judas. Remember they came to Jesus and Peter who had sworn allegiance to the death, had a sword. And he draws his sword, strikes the servant of the high priest, cuts his ear off, which many believe he was aiming to cut his head off. But he took his ear off. Jesus, in his compassion, reached down, picked the ear up, brushed the dirt off, <laughs> and stuck it back on his ear, Perfectly here. And that man never heard so well in his life. <laughs> and I believe he got saved after that. That's just my opinion. But anyway, uh, but Jesus said, Peter, put up the sword into thy sheath. We was in the Holy Land, Brother Logston and I, on the bus, and we was reading that. He read that text. I said, man, that's, that, that sounds like a good, a good topic to preach on. Put up thy sheath. There's a lot of Baptists need to put their swords back in their sheath instead of trying to cut each other's head off. Amen. Amen. That's just a little, little extra. No charge, my father would say. My dad would say, no charge, keep the change. <laughs> anyway, Peter put the sword back into the sheath. And then he said something that is so mysterious for it to be said here and there. And you probably, many of you have never seen significance to it. He said, put the sword back in your sheath. And then he said, the cup, the cup, which my father hath given me. He's already received it, but had he drunk from it yet? He said, shall I not drink it? The cup that I've received of my father. Why did he mention that here and there? Why did he mention that in connection with his crucifixion or his arrest and so forth? Now, there's no doubt in my mind, and I may be wrong on a lot of things, but I have no doubt that the cup Jesus received from his Father represents all the sins of the world, your sins and my sins. I have no doubt about that. But we see Jesus knew 
that if he drank that cup, what would happen? What did Jesus know was going to happen when he drank the, the, the sins, the imputation again, having the sins laid upon him? He drank our damnation dry. Our sins in hell was distilled in that cup represented there. What, what did Jesus know that would cause? Jesus knew that the moment he drank that cup, he would be made sin. He would be saturated. His soul, his pureless, perfect soul would be saturated with your sin and mine as though he had sinned those sins himself, thought those thoughts, and done those deeds himself. And he knew that drinking that cup would mean he would be separated from his father. Separated. Jesus was separated from the father so we could be reconciled. So we would never have to be separated from God for eternity. Hallelujah to God. What a savior. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Praise his blessed name. So that cup, that cup means and represents separation from the Father. As well, I will include that it also represented the unbearable agony of thirst from loss of blood and dehydration. And Jesus' thirst, it was a thirst for, what was that thirst? If the cup separated him from his father, and he had never, never been separated before. And that was probably one of the biggest sacrifices, hardest thing in the decision making to be a savior, that it would take becoming a sin for sin and sinner. It becomes separated from his father that he loved with all his heart. And that sin was going to separate him for the first time ever from his father. And could he have met what he said? I thirst, could it have been? Could it have been a child, a son, saying, I thirst for you, Dad. I thirst for you, Pop, Abba, Father, Papa, my Daddy. I, I thirst for you, Daddy. Where? Oh, I thirst for you. He'd never been separated from him before. I don't know. But his suffering has jo joined the separation from the Father. His suffering and separation of the Father are joined when Jesus drank that cup dry. Oh, my. Now we go to statement number six. Test Estaliah. It meant it is finished. Jesus had to muster up what little strength that he had left and to put into his voice and his vocal cords, enough air to project the statement so others could hear it. It is finished. Test Estelia. It meant that the salvation's work is complete. It's finished. It's done. And he proved that it was not of works. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had to die on the cross. But there was no other way. There'd be any other way. Let this cup pass from me. There was no other way for you to be saved than for Jesus to take your sins upon him and pay the sin debt, the sin penalty of, of death. And the wages of sin is death. So Jesus died, and he proved that it's not of work. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. It's a free gift of God. Salvation is only the prov provisional gift of the grace of holy sovereign God. Oh my, God's infinite plan, God's gracious mystery plan of salvation. Hallelujah. The separation of Jesus 
from the Father, meant substitutionary death of Jesus for us. It meant Jesus taking our place on the cross for him to pay our sins and to pay it in full. He didn't say it is finished until he said paid in full. It is finished. And so he paid our hell-deserving sin debt. And guess what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. God said, I will accept it and declare those that have received by faith Jesus Christ. He said, I, my son, I will justify them. I will accept this as payment in full of their sin. And when God forgives, he forgets and he'll treat you as if you never sinned because Jesus died on the cross as if he did that sin for you. So God's not going to repunish a sin that's already paid for. That would be unholy and unrighteous and unjust. Blessed be Jesus. That's why I love the word appropriation. Speaks of the passion, the suffering, the dying of Christ on the cross. But the Greek language pictures uh, that word perit propitiation like a, 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 a something that absorbs like a sponge you can take a dry sponge and dip it in the water and it will soak up the water and become filled with it propitiation or so put it in, in a, a, a bowl of blood and it will soak up that blood jesus on the cross became our propitiation and he, he took everything that we deserved, uh, and he absorbed it on the cross. He absorbed our penalty of sin. He absorbed the wrath and the judgment of holy God on my wicked sin. Amazing grace. Thank God he was our propitiation, uh, and he's the ground by which we can go to heaven, approach the Father, and daily pray with intercession from the advocate Jesus. Because he's there and with a sin payment with him, amen. It's been offered. It's on the blood. He's sitting on the mercy seat. I believe he poured out his blood from the Calvary's cross on that mercy seat. Bless his holy name. Every time we go to the mercy seat, we will see that it's covered with the blood. Uh, drawn from Emmanuel's veins uh, and sinners beneath that blood. Who's all their guilty stain? Hallelujah. Hallelujah to God. We're redeemed and we're set free and free forever through the amazing grace of God. So, how profound is this truth? The sixth saying, it is finished. It means it's done. It's done. Praise God. Everything that needs to be done has been done praise his blessed his blessed name oh praise god then we're down we're down here to the to the number seven you say brother i still don't care for you You'll act like a pentecostal i'm a baptocostal and i'm not ashamed of it either. uh we hey back pentecostals weren't to 1901 Baptist has been shouting us uh, since the resurrection, praise God. And that's a long lot longer than that. But praise his name. So I'll throw that in there. Keep the change. Amen. All right. Number seven. Number seven. Oh, Father. Oh, nice back to call him Father. Amen. Why? Because it's finished. Oh, the sin bearing's finished. The sin debt is paid in full and accepted by the Father. It's paid in full. And Jesus had finished what God the Father sent him to do, what he volunteered to do, as lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Oh, the cross, the cross. And now he's calling him Father. And he says, Father, into thy hands. I commend my spirit. And having said that, he gave up the ghost, which is the old English word for spirit. And he said, uh, Oh, 
what great truth is this one? What's this seventh great truth? It means to me and to you that God makes when Jesus said, I commit, I commend to you my spirit, and God accepted it, and he did. God makes my eternal eternity uh, sealed, or in other words, he made a commitment that was an eternal, eternal commitment to you and I. He'll not withdraw it. He'll not void it. He'll not revoke it, bless God. You are saved and sealed and delivered when you get to heaven. And praise, praise God. Brother Blaken used to say, FOB, free on bank when you hit the golden shores of glory. Praise God. So he makes an eternal commitment. Now, Jesus, he committed his spirit to the Father, and he did it forever. It was a once and for all eternal act. He's committed. Jesus is still committed in the hands of the Father. And Jesus said in, in, the, in John 10, 28, 29, he made this promise pre-Calvary. He made this promise pre in his finished statement. He said, you, to the, his followers, believers, he said, you are in my hand and I'm in the Father's hand. And he said, so we're in the Father's hand, in Jesus' hand. Praise God. And he said, no man is able to pluck anybody out of my Father's hand. I had a, I had a, a, a man that believed in losing your salvation at work uh, years ago. And I was working at American Bridge Company in Indiana. And uh, he said he believed that the Bible taught you to lose your salvation. And I said, well, my dad said he'll give you $500 if you can prove it with the Bible. So he got kind of excited about that. And he said, he read this verse, no man shall pluck you out. He said, see, you can be plucked by the Father's hand. I said, said, no man can pluck you out. He said, yeah, but I can. This is how he answered me. He said, I can pluck myself out. I said, are you a man or what? He said, well, yeah, I'm a man. I said, did he say no man? And that guy just about swallowed his apples, Adam's apple. Lost that $500 just like that. <laughs> no man. That includes you, praise God. Signed, sealed, sanctified, and saved. Praise God. No one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. Praise God. So what a commitment this is to us. And you could just read those seven statements and know how wonderful they are. Seven awesome truths from the cross. And the, it's the basis and it's the ground, dear friend, for you to receive Jesus Christ. The first statement, the truth of forgiveness. The second statement, he said, you immediately be with him in heaven. The third statement, he said, of forsaken, we shall never be forsaken. He, Jesus said, uh, for, fourth statement, he'll constantly care for you. At verse five, at one with means we're in the Father's hand, one with the Father. And verse six, it's not salvation not earned or deserved. It's total grace of God. And verse 7, God makes an eternal a commitment safe in the Father's hands. So if you're not saved, you can come to the foot of the cross and hear Jesus pray this for you and be saved. Bow at the foot of the cross and receive Jesus Christ and what he did for you. And I'll tell you today, it's enough and by grace and then you live for god do good things for god because you're saved not to be saved you can't earn it or deserve it but boy i tell you what it's wonderful 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 to be saved by grace and grace alone that you can give him all the praise all the glory in his name then if you are saved 
You may be backslid, cold, indifferent. So many people are today. I mean, I, I, I just a sad to see the sad Christians today. I think we still have the Sadducees along with the Pharisees. There's a lot of sad Christians today. They're saved. But I want you to know, get at the foot of the cross. I've got, every time I tried to return, I only did it once or twice, but I tried to resign the ministry. And I'm not worthy to be in the ministry one hour, let alone 50-some years. I don't deserve this. It's, a, it's another great evidence of God's grace that Charles Eisen is called to preach and is allowed to preach even tonight. Maybe people don't think this is much, but thank God, it's a great privilege to me. It sure is. And it's my way of saying, Lord, I love you. And I want to do what you want me to do. But anyway, I've, a couple times, I wanted to turn in my resignation. One time I even wrote it out, put it in the big Bible in the front of the church, and I was all cocked and ready to pull it out and give it to them. I knew some of them wanted it. <laughs> and uh, one time I made the statement, I resigned, and there was two or three amens. I said, I resigned not to quit. <laughs> and boy, there again. They took the colic on me. <laughs> oh, I hope I've got a kick out of that. But anyway, uh, brother, I would have quit. As a matter of fact, at that time and period, I would have quit. But Dennis Thomas, I called him our missionary. We were the supporting, sponsoring church for him in, Cost in Costa Rica. I explained to him what was happening, what I was going through, and I didn't want the church tore up and split. And he said, Brother Rison, you do what you have to do, but don't you leave the flock till you kill off all the wolves. I'll never forget that old I live. And I thought that was a fair thing because we sent him to a foreign country and we didn't want to leave him out there without any ropes to hold him. So I went back in that pulpit as, as much as ever to serve God, and you know, we, the church did split, but you know what, the wolves left, the wolves lost the boat, and uh, they left, and then after the wolves left, I said, well, I don't see any reason to leave now, the wolves are gone, <laughs> so praise God, we just kept on keeping on by the marvelous grace of God, and he's been with us, and never left us, nor forsaken. And I know that I'm unworthy, but I'm trying to say to you, if you're saved, no, you go to the foot of the cross. That's where he told me to go to turn in my resignation and look at Jesus on the cross for me and say, I quit. I give up. I can't do it anymore or any other flimsy or low down insufficient excuse. And I never have been able to do it. I've gone right up to the cross and I've tried. I've tried. I bellowed and cried and moaned and groaned and complained and had a pity party and whining worse than Thomas the disciple. But God convicted me and shamed me and humbled me down to the dust when I saw him there dying on the cross for me. If I didn't know what I know about the cross, maybe I could have. But knowing what I know, what Jesus did for me, I have no justification to quit on him. So if you're saved, he deserves you to trust him, to obey him, and to love him always, no matter what. No matter what Judas comes against you. No matter what Herod or Pilate or anybody else has to say. You trust God, serve God. And Billy Sunday said, if the stars fall out of the sky, keep trusting God in any, any way. Anyway, he says, man, he said, serve God no matter what. Don't quit. Vance Havner said all quitting is of the devil. Oh, we need to get to the foot of the cross. Watch Jesus die there. 
Listen to those seven amazing eternal statements. You know, Spurgeon, one of my favorite preachers, and I just know God's going to have preacher request time when we get to heaven for the pure joy of it. And one of my number one, I want to hear Paul preach. I want to hear Elijah preach. But I also want to hear Charles Spurgeon of London, England preach. And Spurgeon was criticized one day by a preacher. He said, Spurgeon, you always, always end up get back around to the cross every time you preach. And Spurgeon was famous for using the term look and live from numbers where they lifted up the serpent on the, on the pole representing Christ later on the cross. And he would say, look and live. Look and live. W.A. Criswell here in Dallas, he adopted that. And I could hear him preaching as he closed his message, just look and live, look and live. But when that preacher criticized Spurgeon for always ending on the cross or preaching too much on the cross, you know what Spurgeon said? He said, that's the greatest compliment I've ever got in my life. Amen. Where can we go? Where's a better place to be? At Calvary, sweet Calvary, down at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my soul rolled away. So give him praise. Give him worship, for he is worthy. And God promised back to the beginning of the text, he would never leave us nor forsake us. And take these seven sayings of the cross and they sign it, claim it, and believe it, and then serve God. Father in heaven, how great thou art, greatly to be praised. Again, I'm sorry that I could not do a better job for you, Lord. But Lord, you know we don't have a whole lot to work with here. And it's by grace that we can even preach it all. But I thank you, Lord. I thank you that when as a teenage boy, I knelt down in that old New Hope Baptist Church. And I told you, I said, well, I was reading out of Jeremiah. You said you'd put the words in my mouth. And I said, Lord, I'll, if you'll put the words in my mouth, I'll, I'll say them for you. And Lord, I've been letting you do that ever since uh, and i think you've been faithful to me a long time but i want to be faithful to you and i feel like i failed you lord but oh god thank you that you forgive us even after we're saved and as i have told you before sometimes i think it took more grace to forgive me after i fell from you than when you first saved me i don't know it just sort of feels like i needed more grace i don't know but oh god thank you that you will forgive and restore and lord that we're forgivable we're your child uh, and as the prodigal son's father had already forgiven him in his heart before he saw that dirty a uh, pig feeding prodigal boy coming across the, the the hill and he didn't care how dirty he was how bad he smelt like a hog but he put his arms around him and hugged him. And he kissed him. Uh, and Father, I know, I know Jesus uh, was teaching those publicans and harlots and wicked sinners uh, of the kind of Father that the Father God is. Hallelujah. For your name's sake, we pray. Bless our people. Bless our dear church. Thank you for our dear flock. It's faithful uh, to you, Lord. We love you for them and appreciate them. Bless them, God, and Lord, give them what they need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's way. And sinners plunge beneath that blood Lost all the guilty sin, lose all the guilty sin, lose all the 